are uh, going to be continuing our series looking at developing a rule of life. A brief summary for those who weren't here last week, or if you need a quick reminder from last week, we explored diagnosing what is wrong with the world that we live in. Rather than simply saying we are too busy, this isn't working, could you do the slides for me please, the remote's not working. Rather than simply saying we're busy and not knowing what to do about it, we spent some time exploring how the Western world has taught us that the sacred and secular are poles apart and that the public and the private are poles apart. We looked at the symptoms of hairy sickness. Third slide, please. <laughs> um, and I think we were probably all convicted of what they the, of something in that, and that's not a bad thing. I never said this series on developing a rule of life would be easy. So if we know the symptoms and we can diagnose properly what is wrong, we can start to look towards the cure. And not simply putting a plaster over it, because we all know that plasters can easily come off. What we need to actually do is look to the root cause of the problem. The root cause is that the world is moving too quickly. And it ain't going to slow down. It asks us, the world asks us to be busy all of the time. And if we're not busy, we're not doing something right. Because the world tells us that if we are busy and filling our time with everything, then we are worth something. And I'm not going to labor that point too much because that comes into freedom in Christ this week. And I don't want to take away from Tuesday's session, or at least we start in looking at that Tuesday onwards. I told you at the start that these series of freedom in Christ, developing a life, would go hand in hand. And they do. So the problem is busyness. We're all feeling hurried all the time, and we don't get a chance to stop and to rest. And I mean truly rest. So today, we're exploring the invitation that Jesus gives us. Those three verses that Helen read for us. It's an invitation from Jesus. And then we'll start looking at some practices to help us unhurry in the presence of Jesus as we look towards a rule of life. That will work for us. Now, as I say, that reading is well known. It's an invitation. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a well-known passage. It's often quoted. But friends, I think it's one of those well-known passages that we often misunderstand or misquote to people. Come to me, says Jesus, and I will give you rest. We understand what Jesus is saying to us. Come. He invites us to come and have rest. But in our tiredness, in our busyness, in our hurriedness, are we actually stopping and resting with him? Be honest with yourselves. I'll tell you all now that this is one of the areas in the book which I found really, really challenging. Is very good at going to Jesus and praying, but not actually resting. It's an area I've really had to work on. Perhaps, I mean, before I had the gastritis, I was busy. I was actually felt quite out of sorts. I, things got worse until I went to Jesus. But I wasn't actually resting with Jesus. I was thinking I was doing I was doing the plaster, but I wasn't actually doing what I needed to do. I wasn't stopping and listening to him. I just carry on. Now, in a, we're going to watch a short clip by John Mark Comer, which is introducing a study that he's done on this book. It's only about a minute long, but it makes the point for today. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll send the video out on a link after the service because it's not working. We have got internet problems this morning. But one of the issues of the modern world, which takes us back to, to the symptoms of hurry sickness. One of the symptoms is that we're too busy. And indeed, on the next slide, Dallas Willard says that hurry is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life in our day. 
You must ruthlessly eliminate Harry from your life. There is nothing else. That was the quote that John Mark Comer heard, which made him write the book. There is nothing else. It's blunt. What if I ask you a question? I'm not expecting you to give me an answer, so you can be honest with yourself. How many times since coming to church today have you been distracted? How many times have you been distracted? Perhaps your phone's vibrated in your pocket during the first song. Perhaps you turned around to see what the noise was at the back of church. Perhaps you're thinking about what you're cooking for lunch. Perhaps you're planning your to-do list for this afternoon, tomorrow, thinking about that meeting at work tomorrow that you're not looking forward to, or that assignment that's due that you haven't started yet because you've been too busy. Yes, some of those things are natural. Don't get me wrong. And sometimes we will get distracted. It's a symptom of living in this world. But... If we are distracted in church when we are here to give all of our attention to worship God, how distracted do we get when we are at home on our own praying? I imagine we probably get very distracted if you're anything like me. At the moment, I find it really hard because I go into my study, I close the door to pray, and I hear children playing, playing in the lounge, sometimes getting even cross with each other because they've stolen the yellow plate that they both have to have at that particular moment. And then if it goes quiet when I'm praying, I get worried, thinking, what on earth are they up to now? Indeed, I was telling you it was Friday. They were pulling all my DVDs off the shelf. I get distracted when I'm praying, and my attention turns away from God. So what is it, friends, that distracts you? You will all have your own distractions. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And how can you eliminate that distraction? One thing I do is in church, I always make sure my phone is on silent and do not disturb or turned off. I am using it now. I was supposed to be using it for the remote for this, but it's not working at the moment. If it is a funeral, I put it on silent, I put it on do not disturb, and I leave it in the car because I don't trust it to not start making a noise. Perhaps there is something in church that distracts you that you need to work at stopping it to getting in the way. Or perhaps it's at home something that stops get you getting distracted. Indeed, as I was preparing this, in this very moment when I wrote that, I got distracted. There was, a mo there was some movement outside my study window, and I looked out and saw a gentleman walking past. And then an email popped up, and I was like, oh, what's the email about? It was spam. It just needed to be deleted. But I got distracted. My eyes were diverting away from what I was trying to do, which was concentrating on what the Lord was saying to me that he wanted me to share with you this morning. Even computers now have something called focus time, which stop notifications and distractions. Phones have do not disturb modes. How often do we actually use those when we are spending time with God? So rather than using the good old evangelical term of having our quiet time, why don't we start having focus time? Let's have focus time with God. Put it in your diary. Write it down somewhere. Have a notification that pops up that says, now is the time to pray. And then put your phone on do not disturb for however long you need to pray. Because if we start calling it focus time, it will do something to the brain that will start us thinking, this is time to focus on God. Let's try it for a week. See what happens. Jesus is inviting us into a new way of living. He's inviting us to walk a different way of life and a different pace of life. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, C.S. Lewis's spiritual director, Walter Adams, said, to walk with Jesus is to walk a slow, unhurried pace. To walk with Jesus is to walk a slow, unhurried pace. A few years ago, when I was in Curacy, I went to see my spiritual director, who's in Ilkeston. Then it was about a two-and-a-half-hour drive, and I used to leave at 8 o'clock in the morning, drive down to see him at 11. I'd have a couple of hours with him, and then I'd drive back home. It was a whole day out. But it was t those times in the car 
were really focused times when I could think, go in, what do I want to talk to Adrian about? And coming back, it was, what have we discussed? What do I need to reflect on? But one day, I went, and we were chatting, as you do. He says, let's do a spiritual MOT for you, Tim. And he said, I'm noticing something. I'm going to stop. He stopped me mid-sentence, which he never really normally does. He said, I've noticed you're speaking really quickly, you're breathing really fast, and you're distracted. So I want you to stop. We're going for a walk. We're going to find a pub, and we're going to have a drink. And we're not going to talk about church. That's hard for me. When we arrived at the pub, he said to me, how are you feeling now, Tim? I said, well, actually, I'm calmer. I'm more relaxed. I hadn't had alcohol because I was driving. And I'm more able to hear what God is saying. And he looked at me and went, well, it worked. You had too much going on in your mind to hear from God. How many of us, friends, have too much going on in our minds to actually hear from God? I'm not sharing this to say we all need to go for a walk now to the pub and find space with God. But we, it's about what practices can we put in place in our own lives that will work so that we can hear from God. If it is going to the pub, great, go. Probably not now. But it's about listening to him rather than just simply going in prayer, listing our demands, and then carrying on with whatever the day holds. Now, last week I shared John Mark Homer's definition of a rule of life. Learning to live together and love one another. Well, today, Jesus' invitation to the slower, unhurried pace of life is a discipleship issue. It's relevant to us as a church, and it's relevant to us as an individual. Freedom in Christ is discipleship, but at the heart of that course, it's about being Christ-centered. It's about learning to love one another. Are these sounding familiar, friends? There's a reason I put these, back, these banners back up today. Because if we can crack those top three in this series and in Freedom in Christ, then we will naturally start being invitational. We will naturally start being out in the community. If we are Christ-centered, loving one another, and determined to walk that road of discipleship in a slow, unhurried pace with Jesus Christ. God has been working all of these things over the last yeah, well, probably the four years since I've been here and before to bring things together. And it's amazing when that happens. And I, as I was writing this, I thought, do you know what? Yes, God has worked together to bring us to this point to then move us forward. So, what do we need to do when Jesus asks us to come to him? Next slide, please. John Mark Comer says, if you want to experience the life of Jesus... You have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. So how might that look for you and for me, adopting the lifestyle of Jesus rather than just talking about it? The other week, I was on retreat. I took myself off for a walk. I got hopelessly lost. I ended up walking about six miles over 10,000 steps and getting slightly wet as it started to rain just as I was coming back to my accommodation. You might look at that and think, how awful. You got lost. It rained. You were tired from walking so far. But no. Those six miles were probably the closest I felt to God in a long time. I didn't see a single person. I wasn't worried that I was lost. I wasn't worried that I couldn't see anybody or hear traffic because I was in a place of receiving from the Lord. Now, I am in a fortunate place where I'm able to take a retreat in ministry. Indeed, it was the first time I'd done it since moving to Luton. I was gently reminded by the archdeacon that I should be doing it yearly. But yes, we'll start doing that. Yes, archdeacon. But how does a retreat look for you, friends? What does a retreat look like? For Amanda, it's probably not going and spending four days on her own and, do it and just spending time with God. It would most likely be spending a weekend with friends Bible journaling and getting creative and seeing what creativity and the Lord is going to say, you know, want you to do this next. You need to find what works for you. What works for me is not going to work for you necessarily. But basically, retreat is about us deliberately spending extra time with God. It's a place where we put ourselves in a place of surrender to allow him to minister to us 
in ways that the modern world often doesn't let us do so because, guess what, we're usually too busy. Let's try and develop a practice of retreat. However that looks, it doesn't have to be overnight. It could just be a day. It could be a morning or an afternoon. Work out what fits in with you, but make it a priority. Because as I said last week, when I started making more of a priority for God, everything else fitted around it, and it works. I could do more. So I guess the question then, how do we translate the life of Jesus to the lifestyle of Jesus? We're very good at translating the life of Jesus and explaining it, friends. Often in new imaginative ways as we find, another pa- find one of those well-known parables and you think, oh, it's a sermon on the Good Samaritan again. But you hear something new. It's imaginative. We're very good at doing that, about talking about Jesus. But what about if we actually start to live like Jesus? If we want to become, say, good at running... We have to start running and we have to train and train and train and train and train. And it never, ever stops. One of my guilty pleasures is snooker. And I saw this week that Stephen Hendry is saying he's come back, but he doesn't practice. And guess what? He's not winning. He wants to be a professional snooker player, but he's not got the lifestyle of a professional snooker player. Do we have the lifestyle of a Christian? Do we have the lifestyle of Jesus? It's a lifelong journey. It's something that we need to train for. That's what discipleship is, being an apprentice of Jesus. Jesus says, come to me, but we carry on. We just carry on with life. We don't stop and rest. We carry on, yes, we carry on with the right mindset of looking out for the oppressed, the poor, the hungry. Thank you for your gifts. We do that, but do we actually go to the root cause of the problem like Jesus would? The problem, I think, next slide please, is that Anne Peterson, who is a a writer, says that the current modern world and its busyness, she says about this, burnout is a place, isn't a place to go and come back from. It's now the place of permanent residence. I'm going to ask you another question. Again, I don't want an answer. Do you feel burnt out this morning? Do you feel tired and weary from life? Have you got a long list of things to do? You think, how on earth am I going to get all that done? I don't have the time. I would guess most of us, if not all of us, would say, hmm, yeah, I'm feeling like that at the moment. How often do we wake up in the morning tired? How often do we go to bed thinking about all the things that we haven't achieved that day, rather than actually thinking about all the things we have achieved? How often do we go to bed with regrets for things that we've said or done? Times when we've upset people because we've been tired and snapped. Or how often people have misinterpreted the way it was intended. How many times do we go to bed and stay wide awake thinking about everything we have to do tomorrow. Again, it's probably too much for me care to admit. Recently, when our children go to bed, Amanda and I often look at each other and simply slouch on the sofa with a cup of tea and think, whew, we've made it through another day. We watch something on TV, but we're both at the same time scrolling through Facebook on our phones, not engaging with one another. It's a sign of the times. We're trying deliberately to not do that. To deliberately put our phones to one side and do not disturb and spend time with each other. But what about if you go out for a walk? Do you enjoy going out for a walk and do you listen to nature? Or do you have earphones in listening to music or the latest podcast or something from a seminar from work that you need to catch up on? We double up on so many things that we lose out. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a place for listening to music or the latest podcast. When was the last time we just went out and enjoyed nature and listened to creation? I guess for many of us, we hear the words of Jesus in this passage, and we think we are followers of Jesus. But if we're honest, we're tired, we're worn out, and we're burnt out on religion. 
Now, I looked at what you, how Eugene Peterson translates this passage in the message. And again, next slide, please. And he says, he puts it like this. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I love the way Eugene Peterson has paraphrased these three verses. It really speaks So that invitation of Jesus, come to me all who are weary, it might be a distant thing. But when you read it in this paraphrase, it makes it so much more real. Recover our lives. Be shown how to take a real rest. Watch how Jesus does it. The line that is probably my favorite is, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. When I hear it put like that, my heart leaps for joy, and it's what I want. Without wanting to sound like the Spice Girls, it's what I really want. I really want that life. Perhaps one of the ways we've got it wrong in the church, and indeed outside of the church, is that we're very good about talking about the potential that we see in ourselves and in others and in the church, We're very good at looking to others and wanting to go down that route, but then say, oh, there isn't enough time. That's not the solution. What we have been doing where we've got it wrong in the world and in the church is we don't talk about our limitations enough. But we don't just talk about them. We need to accept what our limitations are. If we can get this right in the church, then I think it will have a big impact on our discipleship. If you think about it, if I ask you to go on another rotor, you don't simply say yes because I asked you. You should go away, pray about it. Do you genuinely have time to do it? Will you enjoy it or will you try and squeeze it in and do it reluctantly? If you are going to squeeze it in and do it reluctantly, say no. If you're finding it a chore, say no. It's a powerful word. But what about in the church? I would much rather this church run two or three things really, really well than running ten things that are mediocre. I would much rather we run a few things really well than spreading ourselves too thin and trying to do too much because we have to accept our limitations. As I said last week, and I'll say it again now, I truly believe this is what the Lord is asking of us in this time Because he knows the modern world makes us tired, worn out, burnt out. He knows that we're busy. He knows that our diaries are full to capacity because that's what the world wants. But Jesus is inviting us not just to come to him and rest, but he is inviting us to another way of life. He is inviting us to go to him. Eugene Peterson then says, you will recover your life. Don't you want to recover your life? If we do, we need to discover the lifestyle that enables us to live that slow, unhurried pace. I've been on this journey for a good few months, and I know it will be a journey for life, because I don't want to go back to the old ways. What we need to do, friends, is learn again what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. To learn what it means not to just translate his lifestyle, but to actually Live it. That slide, please. So in essence, we need to learn to be like him, to become like him, and do what he would do if he were us. So what can you do to unhurry your life? Some ideas. Take up journaling. Set a time and a time limit for social media. Show up 10 minutes early for an appointment and use that time to pray. Drive the speed limit. Find 15 minutes each day to be alone with Jesus. They're just some examples. What could you do? What could you do 
to unhurry your life. One thing we can do is turn our eyes upon Jesus. We're going to spend time now just listening to the song. And just take that time to think and reflect. What is God asking you to perhaps stop? What is God asking you to do to unhurry your life?